Good morning, everyone. Great to be here. Have you all sufficiently been caffeinated and you're awake and all that? I hope. All right. I um, want to say thank you to Chad, of course, and uh, the rest of the Wingman leadership for the opportunity to be here, and, and, and Dick's wife. I probably need to thank as well for the, uh, for the sacred echo, but um, I'm, uh, I'm really thankful to be here with you guys and, and be able to share with you this morning, and uh, I'll give a quick intro. Uh, as he said, my name's Mike, and married to my beautiful wife, Alicia, for about 15 years, and uh, I joke around, she's from Texarkana, Texas, and so I tell people she has the thickest southern accent known to man. Um, in fact, it was kind of funny when we were engaged, we were having one of those conversations that, you know, you do about your wedding and all the details and those things. And, and in the middle of one of these conversations, uh, she stops me and, and she says, babe, you know what is so weird? And, and I said, what? And she goes, to think about changing your name in the middle of your life. She goes, I mean, imagine, you know, my whole life I've been called Alicia Walden and now I'm about to be called Alicia Gazzardo. And she goes, can you imagine changing your name in the middle of your life? And so being the troublemaker that I am, I look back at her and I said, well, babe, I, I kind of can. I, I feel like I've already changed my name for you. She goes, what are you talking about? I said, well, my whole life, everyone's called me Mike, and now I'm going to have to have to respond to Mock for the rest of my life. So I'm like, I, I, I feel what you're talking about here. So <laughs> I got beat up for that. It, it didn't end well for me, but, uh, but uh, she's amazing. And we have four kids, uh, so pray for us when you think about it. Um, I actually heard a comedian recently. You guys uh, may have heard him, but he... Uh, he, he had four kids as well, and he was telling this funny story. He said, people ask him, what is it like having four kids? He said, well, just try to picture yourself drowning, and then someone hands you a baby, you know? <laughs> and the whole audience started laughing, and, and I didn't, you know? I just wanted, to, just wanted to stand up and salute and be like, I feel you, you know? I feel your pain. So um, we have a lot of kind of funny stuff that happens around our house having four kids, and I'll, I'll just, as we jump in this morning, give you kind of one of my recent funny parenting stories. We have a a 10-year-old, a 7-year-old, a 4-year-old, and a 2-year-old. So it's, it's non-stop action. And uh, our 4-year-old was arguing with our 7-year-old. And so they're arguing back and forth. And, and finally, she, she looks at my 7-year-old. She's like, you need to stop it. I'm going to tell Alexa you're being mean. <laughs> you know, and I thought, what has happened in the 21st century? My daughter's getting ready to tell an electronic device on her sister, you know. <laughs> and she did. She said, Alexa, my sister's being mean to me, you know. And I didn't hear what Alexa said, but it seemed to appease her. And then I started thinking, hey, this could be great in the future, you know. They start arguing. I go, guys, I'm out. You tell Alexa. Okay, I got things to do, you know. So we'll, uh, we'll see how that works. But anyway, great to be here with you and uh, excited to share with you guys um, this morning. And I, I want to talk to you about a topic that is uh, very near and dear to my heart, and, and that is the, the topic of our identity, and particularly our identity in Christ. And, you know, one of the things that I've, I've realized is that God is continually desiring to use our life, but our perception of ourselves, our identity, and, and His work within us oftentimes will condition the, the, the actions and the responses of our life, and to a large extent condition what we experience with our life. And one of the things I've realized is that no matter how, how old you get, you know, I'm in my mid-40s, but I, I think it'll be the same when I get to my 60s or my 70s, is that we never graduate from the school of identity. Because God is constantly trying to, um, to teach us and grow us and use us until our very last day on this earth. And so um, the title of the message uh, this morning is simply, What the Devil Hopes You Never Find Out About Yourself. And uh, if I were to say this, kind of sounds like a bold statement. Um, but I would say if we were to go around this room and really think about it from a truly a scriptural standpoint, um, it's possible that a lot of people in this room have no idea who they really are. And when I say that, you might be thinking, well, come on, Mike, you know, I'm, I'm Jim, this is Joe, and, you know, we're in Texas, so, you know, that's Billy Bob in the back row there, you know, we, we know exactly who we are. But, but if I were to press a little deeper, a lot of people, what they would probably say is, is something, if I asked about their identity, it would be some conglomeration of you know, maybe their past successes and failures, some of their experiences, maybe what they feel like other people think about them, uh, where they feel like they stack up on the socioeconomic ladder. But the truth is, as long as we measure ourselves in the natural means, we'll never discover who we are spiritually. Because that's exactly what the Bible says we're not supposed to do, is measure ourselves or esteem ourselves by a natural understanding of who we are. In fact, uh, there's a great scripture that illustrates this in 2 Corinthians 5, 16 and 17. Paul is speaking and he says this. He says, so we have stopped evaluating others from a human point of view. At one time we thought of Christ merely from a human point of view. How differently we think about him now. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone and a new life has begun. 
And so Paul is saying, listen, we all size people up, and we do this, right? We look at people, and, you know, we look at how they dress, or maybe what their job is, or, you know, where we feel like, you know, how successful we feel like they are or aren't, and we form an opinion of them. And what Paul is saying here is we used to look at Jesus that way. We used to look at Jesus like, you know, did his robe come from Banana Republic or Target, you know? And, and, and we would look, is he, is he, you know, an attractive guy or not an attractive guy? We used all the natural things that you use to size people up, and we formed an opinion of Jesus. But then he says how differently we think about him now. And, and what he's getting at here is we realize that, that who Jesus was, his identity, his value, had absolutely nothing to do with anything in the natural, right? What it had to do with was his spiritual identity, that he was the Savior of the world, the Son of God. You know, for example, if you think about it, um, if you were to, like, just pretend that there was some advancement in, in technology and they were actually able to, to recreate the face of any person that ever lived. You know, maybe they could take some of the molecules that they had breathed and, you know, backward translate everything. And, and, and let's just say that, that they said, hey, you know what we're going to do? We're going to get to reveal the face of Jesus, Okay. And so I could imagine, you know, it'd be probably the largest television event in the history of the world. I mean, they'd be building it up, doing some huge reveal, and, you know, billions of people watching, and you're sitting on the edge of your seat, right? And, and all of a sudden they reveal, and, and there's Jesus' face on the screen of what he really looked like as a human being. And you're like, oh my gosh, that's, wow, I was not expecting that. Like, that's a face only Mary could love. You know, I mean, it's just like, maybe Jesus was not good looking or something, right? If something like that were to happen, how many of you that would change your opinion or your esteem of Jesus? See, of, of course not, right? Because we realize his identity had nothing to do with how he looks, how good of a carpenter he was or wasn't. We don't even know anything about Jesus in the physical. Everything we value about him comes from who he was spiritually, right? In the same way, though, what this verse says is Paul then turns that around and says, in the same way, that same logic now applies to you is that those who become Christians become new persons. And what he's saying is in the same way, your identity now has nothing to do with anything about your natural looks, your skills, your jobs, your past failures, or anything about where you feel like, you know, you stack up on the social chain. Excuse me, the social chain. He said it has everything to do with who God says you are and your new identity when he comes on the inside of us. But I wonder, some of us, maybe we've heard things like that before, but I wonder how many of us really on a day-to-day -day basis are, fi are finding ourselves in our new, our new spiritual identity, are looking at ourselves that way. You know, the Bible says things like this. The Bible says that, you know, we're more than conquerors, but how many of us still measure ourselves based on our failures of the past? You know, the Bible says things like you're fearfully and wonderfully made and have such value that all of heaven stops and rejoices when one person comes to know Jesus. But yet how many of us, maybe we let our identity be influenced by what we think, you know, the latest person at work may be thinking about us. See, my point is the Bible says all things have become new, but so often we still look at ourselves and measure ourselves according to the things of this old life. And the reason why I highlight that to you this morning is because it is literally, it's been scientifically proven that you will never consistently live in a way that is inconsistent with what you believe to be true about yourself. I need to say that again, maybe. You will never be able to consistently live at a level that is not consistent with what you believe to be true about yourself. Let me give you an example. How many of you guys, maybe when you were in high school or college, and, or maybe some, you still know someone like this, but, you know, there's this really beautiful girl, could probably go out with any guy she wanted, and she continually goes out with guys that treat her like garbage. You ever seen this before? And you're thinking, what is wrong with this girl, you know? And, and maybe, you, you know, you're a friend of hers, you counsel her sometimes, and she'll call you up, and, you know, this person is treating me so terribly. And you're thinking, well, just break up with them. And she's always got some excuse why she can't, you know? And, and then finally, she goes out with a good guy. You know, like, you're thinking, she's finally seen the light, right? And so she goes out with this guy for, like, two weeks, and then she breaks up with him. And you're thinking, you know, what happened? You ask her, and she's like, oh, he was too nice, you know, something like that. See, the problem with that is that girl sees herself as garbage. And so she continually gravitates towards people that treat her in line with what she really believes to be true deep down about herself. To the point where when someone actually treats her above what she believes to be true, it'll make her uncomfortable to the point where she'll sabotage her situation and gravitate right back towards someone that treats her in line with what she really believes to be true about herself. And until she changes her view of herself, her identity, she'll continue to live from under that deception for the rest of her life. And I say that because the same is true for us. 
in our own blind spots and deceptions of who we are, if we don't lift the lid of our understanding of who we are and what God has done on the inside of us, without knowing it, we too will live under those false pretenses that will limit what we experience and what we want to, what we allow God to do in and through our lives. I don't think it's too much of an overreach to say our understanding of our identity will in many ways direct the course of our life. And so here's what I want to do this morning. I want to take a few minutes and I want to walk you through how God originally created us and then what he actually accomplished on the cross and what that means for you today. Because I think sometimes we talk about our identity, but if we don't talk about it in line from the understanding of what happened from the very beginning, we don't often understand exactly what Jesus accomplished and we can't actualize or live it out or maybe believe it to the extent that we should. And so we're going to walk through this from the beginning, and then if we have some time at the end, maybe we'll kind of take that knowledge and juxtapose it to some of the things that we allow to shape our identity and hopefully see how uh, deceptive that can be and maybe free ourselves from, from some of those false pretenses. And so um, let's start all the way back in the beginning this morning. We're going to take a little journey through the scripture and see how God created us and what he accomplished, uh, reaccomplished in us in the cross. And so in Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 27, God is creating the universe. He's created the universe. He's created the earth. He's created the animals. And now he gets to the point where he's creating us, human beings. And this is what it says in verse 26. God says uh, of Genesis chapter 1, God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, so that they can rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky, over the livestock and the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. Then it says again, so God created mankind in his own image, In the image of God, he created them male and female. And that word image is probably best translated replica. That literally when God made you and me, when he made the human race, he made us as a replica of himself, just like himself. In fact, we see this confirmed in Genesis 2-7. It says, the Lord formed formed the man from the dust of the ground. Our bodies were formed from the dust of the ground. But when it came to our spirit, our true identity, it said he breathed the breath of life into man's nostrils and the man became a living person. And that word breath in the Old Testament is synonymous with the word spirit. What that literally means is God gave of his own spirit to create us. And so maybe one of the easiest ways to understand that from a a natural standpoint is, is that God left that pattern in place when we procreate. For example, when you have a son or a daughter, your son or daughter is not you, but they carry all of your ingredients, right? All of your DNA in them. And in the same way, from a spiritual standpoint, when God created us, he literally created us with his divine DNA as who we were. And so that's why Adam was able to walk with God in the cool of garden. They were able to walk in in oneness and fellowship. But of course, we know that sin came and that caused separation between man and God. And just to clear up, you know, a common misconception, uh, God didn't separate from us when we sinned because he was mad. Okay, sin forced separation between man and God. Because as long as man was pure and God was pure, it's like two pitchers of pure water. They could mix together as much as they wanted and it was pure. But as soon as man became impure, then it was like one of those pitchers became muddy. And so if God were to mix with something impure, then he himself would become impure, right? And because God's holy and perfect, he could never mix with with man when we were sinful and impure. And so separation was forced that God never wanted. And of course, the rest of the Bible is just a love story of God trying to overcome that sin to be reunited with us, right? But when sin came over the human race and we were separated from God, his spirit could no longer dwell on the inside of us. And the impact that had on mankind cannot be overstated. I mean, I really can't think of a good example. It's like mankind lost its divine spark, our true identity, the way we were created to live and be. Uh, Maybe uh, an imperfect example might be uh, something like a laptop computer. Um, You know, laptops obviously can do so many different things. They have limitless potential. You know, you can do simple things like a spreadsheet or a Word document, or you can surf the internet. You can do thousands of computations in a second. Uh, You know, if you have the right access, you can launch missiles, you know, across the globe. I mean, it's, it's limitless what you can do. But if you had a laptop that had lost the power cord and the battery had died, you know, that laptop becomes just a shell of its true potential, right? And the same thing happened to us as the human race when God's spirit was separated from us. But then, of course, we know Jesus comes. And Jesus takes on human form, body of dust, right? But he has no sin in him, so the spirit of God can dwell in him once again. And so now we're back to the original formula, right? In fact, the Bible literally calls Jesus the second Adam. 
So we now get our second glimpse of mankind as God originally intended us to be. He's the laptop with the power cord back, right? And so mankind marvels at Jesus. Jesus is doing miracles. He's doing all these incredible things. But, but here's what I want you to see, is when Jesus came, he came for two reasons. The reason most of us know about is, of course, he came to live a perfect life, die as our substitute so that we could have our sins forgiven and be reunited to God. But the other reason why he came was to model for us and be an example of the way we were going to be able to live when we re-inherited God's spirit on the inside of us. And so everything God did was a model. And that's why the Bible says that he was the perfect high priest, because he lived with all the limitations of a human being. He not only understands all our temptations and weaknesses, but he became the perfect model of what a life that lives in constant submission to the Holy Spirit can look like. And that's why everything Jesus did with his disciples, he was preparing them, he was coaching them, teaching them, so that they would be ready when they received the Holy Spirit again. So he would teach them how to pray, right? He sent them out on mission trips and, and gave them glimpses of their authority. You know, he would, he would do things like, you remember the, the story in the Bible where Jesus looks for a fig on a fig tree and can't find it, and so he curses the fig tree. And then they come back, you know, the disciples come back with him, uh, you know, the next day, and they look, and the fig tree is withered. And they marvel, they go, Jesus, look at this fig tree you cursed, and, it, you know, it's already withered. And, and how many of you guys remember, Jesus didn't look at them and be like, yeah, I'm the man. You want to see another magic trick? Watch this, you know. Instead, he looked at them and said, you can do that. He said, in fact, if you have faith, you can say to this mountain, be removed and go in the sea, and it'll obey you. All the way up to the Last Supper, you know, they're talking to Jesus, and he says, listen, greater things than I have done, you're going to do. See, he's trying to understand and get them to this point where they understand this transference that's about to happen. He said, I know I'm the only example you've ever seen, but you're about to inherit the Spirit of God the same way I have, and the same way I've modeled for you as I walk this earth. And I want you to see in John 17 what happens here when Jesus goes to the cross, because it's so incredible. In John 17, verses 20 through 23, Jesus is getting ready to go to the cross. He's in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he's praying to the Father. And how many of you guys know when Jesus prays, he prays in line with what he knows the Father already wants, right? He's not praying some renegade prayer here. And, and this is what he says. He says, I am praying not only for these disciples, but also for all who will ever believe in me through their message. So who's he praying for? Us, right? He says, I pray that they will be one just as you and I are one. As you are in me, Father, and I am in you, and I pray that they, will be, um, that they will be in us so the world will believe that you sent me. And I have given them the glory that you have given me, so that they may be one as we are one, I and them, you and me. May they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me and that you love them as much as you love me. Now, I want you to see the magnitude of what Jesus is praying here. First of all, he's praying, Father, with what I'm about to do on the cross, I want you to make them one with you the same way that I'm one with you. That literally, the oneness that I've experienced, he says, just as we are one, I want you to create that same oneness in them. And then he says, the glory which you've given me, I've given them. And that word glory is literally the word doxa. It means estimate or esteem. And Jesus is saying the same value, the same esteem that you've given me, Lord, when I go to the cross, I want you to give that same thing to them. And then he says and confirms that by saying, then the world will know that you love them as much as you love me. I mean, we could do a whole sermon on just understanding what it would do to our minds if we walked every day with the confidence that God has the same love and, and, and deference towards you that he did through Jesus. You know, we all think when Jesus prayed, of course, God was listening, God the Father was listening in a heartbeat, but few of us realize that he looks at you with that same love and priority. And so he prays this, and then he accomplishes the very thing that he prayed when he goes to the cross. So Jesus goes to the cross, and one of the greatest verses in the Bible, 2 Corinthians 5, 21, says, He made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God. So Jesus, who is the righteousness of God, we were sinful man. He becomes sin for us, takes our place, so that we can become the righteousness of God. And through his sacrifice, he gives us his place of perfection before the Father. And he restores us back to the place that we were originally created to be. And it's important to realize this, because I think if not, what we do is sometimes we think what Jesus did on the cross was kind of like a new thing. But really what he accomplished on the cross was restoring us back to God's original intent for how he created us from the very beginning. 
And this is confirmed by the vernacular of the Bible. When we read about what Jesus did, it's always a restoration process, not something that's brand new, right? So, for example, if you have a word, like you have the word build, okay, we know that means that you build something. But if you put re in front of it, that's a prefix that changes the meaning of that word. If you rebuild something, that means it was built once, but it got built again, right? And so when you look at how the Bible talks about what Jesus did, you know, 2 Timothy 2, it says that he came to recover us from the devil. Galatians 4 says that he redeemed those under the law. We were deemed, and then we needed to be redeemed, right? In 1 Peter 5, it says he restored us. Colossians 3 said we were renewed according to his image. And I said all that because I want to bring you to this last one in John 20, 22. And you remember Genesis 2, 7, where I said at the very beginning, he breathed on us, he gave us of his spirit, and we became a living being. Then we fell, God's spirit had to be removed from us, Jesus goes to the cross, lives a perfect life, dies as our substitute. After he was raised from the dead, he's sitting with his disciples. And in John 20, 22, it says this, it says, and when he had said this, he breathed on them one more time, just like Genesis 2, and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Or basically, have again that which was lost, that's what which I originally intended you to have, who was lost for this time, and now through Jesus' sacrifice, we've been made perfect again, and the Spirit of God can be one with mankind, just like God originally intended in Adam and displayed more fully through Christ. And I think for some of us, I know it might take some time, you might need to ruminate on this, but there is a, there's a massive transition in our life when we can fully understand what actually happened to you when Jesus came on the inside of you. And can I tell you something? So much of the rest of the New Testament is just Paul and the other writers trying to get us to understand, do you realize what took place when Jesus came in you? And what that means for your potential, for your worth, your value, your confidence, your identity. You know, so many scriptures take on a different meaning. You know, 1 Corinthians 6, 19, we've heard before, Paul said, don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? We read that and we think, oh, that's great. You know, God lives in me. But you see, the, the magnitude of those words to people in Paul's time would have been so huge. Because before Jesus, the only place on the earth that the concentrated power of God dwelt at all times was in the temple of God. And, and of course, in the temple, they had the Holy of Holies, where the concentrated power of God dwelt so strongly that if anyone entered the Holy of Holies, they would fall down dead. The only person that could ever enter was the high priest. He could enter one time per year to make atonement for the sins of the people. And it was so strict, before he could enter, he had to do all these rituals, you know, put a little blood on his right ear and toe and, you know, do the hokey pokey and turn himself around and, and, uh, and then he could go in. And they would actually tie a rope around the high priest's ankle with bells so that, you know, they could hear if everything was going okay and if for some reason he was ceremonially unclean or something had gone wrong and he fell down dead, they could pull him out and anoint the next high priest and, and send him in, right? <laughs> and, and what Paul is saying is, hey, now that same concentrated power of God dwells on the inside of you. Like the heaven of heavens can't contain him, but he lives in you, right? And all of a sudden, some of those verses where they say, listen, Paul says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. See, some of those verses take on a different meaning when we really understand what happened to us and the magnitude of what he accomplished in us. You know, I think for some of us, if we can take some time and maybe think about some of these scriptures and let this grow on the inside of us, it'll change the way we live, and that's the most important thing. It should change the way we pray. Listen, I've talked to so many people that are praying, and, and they have no confidence when they pray, and I say, why? Well, I don't think God's going to hear me because, you know, I've kind of had a bad week. Made some mistakes, have sinned, you know, I'm kind of, why would God listen to me? I said, wait a minute, the only reason why you're able to be one with God is because you qualify based on Christ's performance, not your performance. And last time I checked, Christ's performance is still perfect. So when you stand before the throne of God, you stand with perfection in your weakest, you know, moment in the natural. You are still perfect in the sight of God and can come boldly to the throne of grace and receive mercy, but you are also always worthy of his richest blessings because you're still walking in perfection. The Bible literally tells us that we are clothed in Christ. See, when we realize that, it, it changes our confidence a little bit, right? Now we go to pray, even when we've had a bad week, we go, God, I thank you that I've had a bad week, but since I come into your presence based on Christ's perfection, you see me as perfect and I am completely qualified for the, for, for, to be in your presence and pray and ask you for whatever is on my heart and receive the fullness of whatever blessings that you've ordained to give me, right? 
You know, it should change the way that we read Scripture. You know, when he says greater things than I have done, you will do, we go, of course, because you're living in us to the same extent that Jesus modeled when he was in human form, and we also have Jesus interceding for us too. So we've got a double whammy on our side, right? You know, if we could understand this morning, I know we don't have time this morning maybe to just continue to dive into, but, you know, as you do this on your own time and you really begin to, to dive more into who God has you to be, I'm just telling you right now, the devil begins to panic. <laughs> you know what the devil's thinking? He's thinking, I had enough problems with one Jesus. He starts duplicating himself in the lives of all of his followers, and my life's not going to be worth living for a minute. <laughs> and Jesus is going, that's exactly the plan, right? And so I, I want us to begin, I wanted to at least walk you through that process so we can begin to understand maybe a little more fully what Jesus actually did and realize that these things need to be, we need to take time to really understand them deeper. You know, sometimes I've talked to people about this topic and they say, well, Mike, if you know, if what you're saying is true, then how come I'm not walking out, you know, praying for people every second, they're all getting healed? Well, the truth is this, is that while God is resident in us and that potential is there, there's a lot of training that needs to take place for that potential to be realized. For example, when my son was born, within him resides all the potential to be a, a rocket scientist, a brain doctor, a black belt in karate, but there's a lot of training that needs to take place before he's going to be able to realize that potential, right? And it's the same thing with us. In fact, in Luke 6.40, Jesus said, Students are not greater than their teacher, but the student who is fully trained will become like his teacher. You know, I, I think that's why Paul and, and some of these people in the New Testament, they're always encouraging us to spend time with God, to, to study the scriptures, to grow. They're not doing it. They're not telling you to spend time with God to check off some spiritual to-do list or like God's going to give you extra credit. Again, God already sees you perfectly through Christ's performance. He's telling you to do it not for God's sake so that he looks at you any different but for your sake so that you can understand more about what God has made available to you. And as you understand it more, you believe it more, your faith is released, and you experience it more. See, And we'll see more and more of his life and his power at work within us on a consistent basis. And so let me do this. I know we only have just a, a couple minutes, so let me, let me skip this first one. I'll, I'll just go to these last two things, just the last two, three minutes here. Knowing that, I maybe want to dispel some of the ways that we currently draw our identity, and I'll just hit these two is that one of the things we do, I talk to people, and before they really understand this fully, a lot of times they're worried their, their opinion, their identity of themselves comes a lot from other people's opinions. What other people think about them. You know, their identity is constantly going up and down like a roller coaster. And as someone who used to struggle with this a lot, what I've realized is it's one of the dumbest things we can ever do. You know, when, when you're allowing other people's opinions to shape your identity, you are literally living in a fantasy land. Because isn't it true that most of the time we don't really know what other people are thinking about us? We're in bondage to what we think they're probably thinking, right? I mean, maybe you're walking down the hall at work or you're at the mall and you kind of, you know, trip or stumble or whatever. There's some people around and, you know, you get that thought, oh my gosh, probably people probably think I'm an idiot, you know, and you're, you know, feeling bad for, you know, a couple minutes or whatever. You don't even know if they saw you. Half the time we're in bondage to what we think people might be thinking. You know, I love what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 4, 3 through 4. He says, but with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by a human court. In fact, I don't even judge myself. For I know nothing against myself, yet I'm not even justified by this. But he who judges me is the Lord. Here's what Paul's saying. He said, I don't really care what you think. He said, in fact, I don't even care what I think about myself. He said, the only person that's going to judge me is the Lord, and that's all that matters. Think about it, if you could go back to your fourth grade self and, you know, grade school self and you got your report card and you got an A, you know, if you never got an A, maybe a plus in kindergarten or what have you, you know, you got a good grade and you were showing one of your friends, you said, hey, check it out, I got an A. If your friend looked back at you and said, oh yeah, well, I don't think you got an A. Would you look at your report card and be like, oh, you, you don't think I got an A? Maybe I didn't, you know, walk away all sad. Of course not. You'd look back at him and be like, it doesn't matter what you think. The teacher gave me an A, sucker. You know? And, and here's the point is that at the end of your life, the only person who's going to give you a grade on your report card is God. See, in the same way as the teacher is the only one with an authority to give you a grade on your report card at school, God is the only one who has that authority for you. So what does it matter what anybody else thinks? In the same way, it's totally irrelevant whether or not someone agrees with the teacher. It's totally irrelevant whether someone 
agrees with God on his perspective of you, which is in perfection through Christ. You know, another thing we do, sometimes I've talked to people and they say, well, Mike, here's the thing. Um, it's not other people's opinions. It's my own opinion of myself. You know, I just, I just look at, you know, maybe some things I feel God's called me to do or some things I feel like he's spoken to me and I just, I don't feel like I have the skill. I don't feel like I'm worthy enough. I don't, you know, I just don't see myself that way. Well, listen, if you don't see yourself as having the ability or, or the worth to do what God has called you to do, join the club. <laughs> because none of us do. In the natural, none of us qualify. That's the point. In fact, most of the people, everyone God used in the Bible didn't qualify in the natural. And can we all just agree that most of the time, one of the prerequisites was that they didn't qualify in the natural, right? You know, I love, you look at people like Paul. I mean, Paul is probably the most effective Christian to ever live outside of Jesus. And, and do you know the Bible records he was actually a terrible speaker? I mean, this guy that went everywhere speaking, founding churches, and, and it literally says in 2 Corinthians 10.10, 10, it says, For some say, Paul's letters are demanding and forceful, but in person he is weak and his speeches are worthless. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, Paul is actually the only guy I know of in recorded history that actually killed a person with his preaching. He literally killed a guy. I'm not kidding. It, it says in Acts 29, as, pokes, as Paul spoke on and on, a young man named Eutychus, sitting on the windowsill, became very drowsy. Finally, he fell sound asleep and dropped three stories to his death below. <laughs> Listen, when, when you're speaking and people are kind of tired, you know, that's one thing. But when you're killing people, I mean, you know, it might be time to reconsider tent making at that point, you know. Of course, if we read that story, we know God used Paul to raise that kid from the dead. And, and how many of you guys know Eutychus from that point on, he sat in the front row taking notes, you know, like... <laughs> He never fell asleep in church again, right? But the truth is, he couldn't have been that engaging of a speaker. But it didn't seem to hinder God's ability to use him, because again, God was using him according to his call, not according to Paul's qualifications. Listen, Peter and John, you know, two of the, the three core disciples of Jesus, remember after Jesus risen from the dead, and they walk up to the leper at the temple gate, beautiful, and they say, silver and gold have I not, but what I have I give to you, and God does a miracle through him and heals the, the leper. And so he's dancing in the streets. People are getting saved. It says 5,000 were added to the church that day. And, and so the, the authorities come and arrest Peter and John. And, and they interview them. And, you know, you, you think they'd be impressed. But the Bible literally says the first thing that they said about Peter and John is that they could tell they were uneducated men. <laughs> so I picture it something like this. You know, Paul, or Peter and John do this miracle. And, and, and so, you know, there's revival happening. You know, there's like rioting in the street. And the authorities are asking questions, who did this? And, you know, these two guys. And so they arrest Peter and John, get them in a room. And they go, hey, guys, what, what, what happened out there? Peter and John start telling their testimony, and they're looking at each other like, y'all didn't pass the fourth grade, did you? You know? But you know, the very next thing, it said that they could tell that they'd been with Jesus. See, here's the point. When you realize your true identity, it doesn't matter about your ability or inability, your strengths or your weaknesses, your failures or your successes, because the most powerful force in the universe lives on the inside of you. And Jesus' sacrifice, his perfection, qualifies you to do everything God has called you to do. And so our confidence no longer needs to lie in anything about the natural, but at some point in our life, we have to transition that confidence to go, God, I can look at myself and see every excuse of why I'm inadequate and unworthy. But in the same time, I can look at your perfection and go, thankfully, I qualify because of this, and it never changes. So I can be fully confident to do everything you've called me to do. Uh, I'll close with this thought. Is that I believe that some of you, God wants to begin to introduce you to yourself. You know, the Bible's a whole book of God introducing people to themselves that didn't know who they were. Moses says, God, I'm a stutter." He says, actually, you're my mouthpiece that I'm going to use to deliver Israel. Gideon says, I'm the least person in the least family in the least tribe of all of Israel. He says, how are you doing, mighty man of valor? You're going to lead my people to a great victory. Paul thought he was a killer of Christians. Jesus said, actually, you're my chosen instrument for the Gentiles. Peter said, Lord, depart from me. I'm a sinful man. He said, no, you're the rock on which I'm going to build my church. Listen, who are you? If God set Jeremiah apart when he was in his mother's womb to be a prophet to the nations, what did God set you apart to do for this next season of your life? Because if we're going to realize that to the fullness, at some point we've got to let go of the old and realize that we are a new creation. The old is gone. Nothing about the natural matters. 
and the new has come. You're a new creation in Christ, and everything about our confidence, our identity, and our belief in what is possible through us should come through our understanding of that. Make sense?